Well, I was going to compare it like this. Have you ever gotten off-brand Legos and tried to use them with regular Legos? We're going to need a different analogy, kindergarten teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, what's this one here? That is for... Does that need to be... Okay. Oh, God. Wow. Nice chair. This is starting to be a dumpster fire in three seconds. Then. <laughs> Aren't you so glad? Yeah, I can't think of three people I'd rather not sit at the table with. Was it? <laughs> oh I think my it, was god! It, was it you that said, you know, if you have to ha- use the beep at least seven times in an episode, five. your ratings go up? Five. I'm like, this oh, is going to be like five because of authenticity. Yeah, Ooh. people feel like you're being real. Ooh, you yeah. know, do you know a fishing guy that doesn't curse? No, I've had I've had pastors Me? in my boat that say, "Hey man, can you clean up your mouth a little bit?" True story. And then they lose a fish, and they teach me things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I go, hey, a, that's a little bit of a hypocrite there. a really there. good story about a pastor. Uh, we are you? rolling, too, so you can just tell it. Oh, re- okay. Uh, yeah, talk fast, because I'm not sure which way this is going to no, go. No, this is good. So I, I had, there was a guy on social media. He was very active in the fishing industry, always posting fish, fish pictures and whatever. And at one point he said, um, I'm, I'm getting off of social media. What I've realized is that fishing has become a false idol for me. And I've decided to give it up and recommit myself to the Lord. So it was a few days later, I had this, this pastor in the boat. And I said, hey, what do you think about that? Like, do I need to give up fishing? And he said, well, I'll tell you this. I'd much rather have somebody out on the lake thinking about the Lord than have somebody in church thinking about fishing and i said so i don't have to give perfect i said so i don't have to give it up and he goes i think it would be more of a sin to do that yeah a lot of smiles just came across people's yeah that's that's a good thing uh here we are we're jumping into another episode of the ice team podcast we're still at the saint paul ice show uh we've been here for like 72 days straight now at least it feels that way and i'm sure our bodies do uh labor of love and we got ross robertson joining us you know ross uh honestly Oh. <laughs> Wrong one. Who's this one? Ross Robertson joining us. Woo! Oh, boy. Uh, Ross, oh boy. Ross has hosted his own podcast. Ross has been on television. Uh, Ross is an improv guy. I'm going to let him tell a real quick story about uh, what helps ratings with podcasts. We're gonna, and we're going to jump into, into Ross's my world. Uh, I, my, kind of minorly apologize in advance for some of it, but no. This dude has got a wealth of information when it comes to fishing, but is super entertaining. We've leaned on Ross for a lot of things throughout our years at Clam, development of product, um, insight, knowledge, a number of things. So we're going to tap into some of that. And of course, we got Durham and Drew joining us today to have some fun here. The show is not open yet. It's close. We're 25 minutes away from open, so there's a little bit of controlled chaos at this moment. But when you hear all pandemonium break out behind Durham and Drew... Uh, it's because the first hundred people in the clam booth get a free bucket. People will do a lot of things for a bucket. I would do it's a insane. lot of things for a bucket. <laughs> Could you, the, well, Home Depot has a lot, so let me know what you'll do. <laughs> should I make a list? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you you got to be careful what you challenge Durham. So the preposterous statement on the podcast yesterday with Brower, in my mind, was when Jason Durham said, I don't take any risks. And then oh Brower God. jumped on right away and said, did you see your outfit last night? Well, and yeah. the funny thing, I was in another sponsor's booth last year doing yeah. some stuff, and uh, all of a sudden this guy walked by, and everybody just stopped, right? Yeah. And the owner of the company there, I say, Durham! And he turns around, and the owner goes, why did I not surprise do you know that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like Michael Jackson meets Clam meets Sequin. That's what it was. I, I think of it. Is like the Elton John of the St. Paul Ice Show. Yeah. Piano Man. Have you ever dressed up as a bucket? That's a really good idea. Okay. Just, like, yeah. just like saying. Think Devo. Just like it's pop your arms up the yeah. side, you know, like just walking around. Yeah. And then we did start this with, you know, what people would do for a bucket. So, I mean, I'm just saying, like, there's opportunity there. You're saying it should come full circle. <laughs> yes. Mm. Mm. Buckets and T-shirts. Yeah. I'm always amazed at what people will stand in line or a t-shirt. Or, t-shirt. or, t-shirt. or, t-shirt. or, t-shirt. or Sam towels. Sobey meet yeah. and greet. Or, yeah, Sam Sobey meet and greet. That like, was crazy. got to watch that, uh, you know, talk about controlled chaos. That was like three hours. hours of, two, three hours. That was nuts. Yeah. 
you know, and think about Sobe before we jump into this, like that I love and I was telling people and some people don't quite grasp the YouTube thing. You know, the one thing I love about Sobe, none of many is like he's more authentic off camera. Most of these guys I meet in the YouTube really meet him in person. It's like, okay, like I don't want to say they're actors. That wouldn't be fair, but they definitely personify something else when they get on camera. And then you meet them and you're like, oh, that, you know, I'm not going to say it ruins it for me. It's a little different. But then you meet Sam and you're like, as great as he is on camera, he's better off camera. Yeah. And that's a good, that's a compliment, right? So, and that's why the lines of people and everyone was like, well, how many like high school kids do we want in the booth? Dude, it wasn't high school kids. No, it was a lot of. It was adults that and, some. Yeah, I heard some stories where they flew in to get an on, like flew into the St. Paul show to meet him. That's awesome. On, like flew, like literally on a plane to to get an on, not to buy a fish house. To so pretty cool stuff. Very um, few people flew in to meet me <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> almost, well, almost done. Ross flew in to meet us. So that's the one. Yeah. That I have <laughs> just, on my just list. you, Derm, to see the cast. I'm glad. Oh man, the Wonder, the Wonder Bread thing that was epic. That was naughty. That Thank was you. epic. And didn't you say there was some of your children walking around in Wonder Bread costumes too? <laughs> I heard. No, it. so there was a booth that these guys had Wonder Bread sweatshirts, and I'm walking down the aisles, and I couldn't go ten feet without somebody grabbing me and wanting a picture. Yeah. Whether it was somebody working the show or a family, could we take your picture with our kids? And and so these three women came up to me, attractive women who said, you need to come and get your picture taken with our friends. And I went, oh, yes, that, this is a good idea. Yeah. And about halfway, they stopped and turned to me and said, our boyfriends are over here wearing these Wonder Red shirts. <laughs> and they, as I got close to the booth, they turned and saw me and they froze because they're like, oh, my gosh, somebody else did this. And I yeah. just yelled out, we shop at the same store. And yeah. they laughed, and we got our pictures yeah. together, and I had instant friends. Well, they looked at you and probably thought, no, someone did this better. Well, well my friend Taylor thought you just wanted to play Twister with him. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I heard that, too. <laughs> there were comments about that. And oh, man. It was just all in good fun. Thank you for doing that. Seriously, You're and, and you, you made a comment yesterday, I believe, when we were chatting about the magic of why you do it, and I think it, that w- I'd never heard that angle of it, and it's spot on. You know, you come to the St. Paul Ice Show for something special, yep. for magic, for something cool, yep. and uh, you bring that it factor, dude. Thanks. So well, let's talk about Ross. Let's talk um, about Ross. He's nervous a little bit, uh, probably. I haven't done one of these before. Does this work? <laughs> <laughs> Ross, has, you have your own podcast. I do. Big Water Podcast? You got it. Yeah, I've been on it. We've had some fun. You have. Yeah, so he's got a lot of cool dudes and gals and industry people on there, so definitely check that out. He's been doing podcasting for a while. A uh, little probably less, I don't know, in, more invasive than ours? Yeah. Is that the word to yeah. use? Yeah. Well, we've had fisheries biologists on, and then we've had Al Linder, and then we've had guys that are a little um, you know, PG-13 and above. <laughs> sure. But I, I uh, think that uh, it's kind of funny because when I first started doing the podcast, I wanted to do it kind of my way. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then I also wanted to tell the stories of other people. I want to hear things kind of like what you guys are doing, mm-hmm. things that maybe you just don't hear, and asking things that guys – and I like to think I can get guys to open up because they know I'm going to be honest with them, but yeah. I'm also not going to kind of backdoor them where they're not going to hear something on them and be like, oh, my gosh, my boss or my wife or my sponsor or something's going to be mad. Yeah. And so I think that's what we try to do, and I think people – they get all in the PC world that we're in. Yeah. And I understand it to a point, but it's funny because one of the companies that I work with, I sent them my first podcast mm-hmm. before it ran, and I said, hey, because there are some people there that were a little more reserved with things. And I said, Here, here's what I'm doing. Where are we at before this goes live? Because I don't want no surprises, and you're a big part of what I do. And it was funny because a couple of the most reserved people at this company that just have different opinions on a lot of things in life than I do, said, oh, man, this is great. I hope you keep doing this. And I'm like, there's no issues with this. You know, it wasn't like risque or anything, yeah. but it just wasn't totally PC with stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was just amazing. Like, what's oh, a podcast? That's what, you know, it's not a radio show. It's this yeah. is not like, there's no surprises. Like, this is what you kind of expect. Yeah. And I think people really like the honesty. And like what you said with uh, uh, Sam there, you know, like those, these things are, are becoming more and more rare. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of people out there. And again, let's not get into politics or anything, but when, when you start talking about people, what you think they want, because a certain small percentage of the population says something, yeah. the bulk of people, when you, when you do kind of natural, real stuff, 
That's what they really want. Yeah, but everybody's really kind of afraid to say that. You yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah, right. I mean, even here, I think we have to do certain things with the ice team. Like there's mm-hmm. a certain level of professionalism that we're expected to have and things. But you know, there's a lot of us guys that when we're doing stuff on the side, you know, we're joking around and doing things <laughs> that maybe we wouldn't do in public. Yeah. But a podcast yeah. seems to be one of those things that we can kind of skirt that line yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And and that's and that's part of the reason I think we've leaned on you for things is because you are all you are always honest. And I don't mean that that other people aren't. Meaning like you're gonna tell you the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, you, you assume that anyone that you're speaking to is going to have thick skin, you know? And, and I think that's from a nice a, way of saying right, it. From a product development, like oh. I know like our R and D team, like the Tom Walters of the world, right? They have like sent you specific prototypes knowing like, we're going to get a pretty blunt response on if, when, how, well that, and you fish in a terrain, let's call it one of the toughest on Lake extreme. Erie where right. you're all, you're the absolute extreme. Mm-hmm. So you're going to beat on stuff hard. Um, so, but no, you, you nailed it, man. It, it's been fun uh, to lean on you on some of that stuff, but you know, outside of the podcast, you know, check it out. Big water podcast, make sure you check out, you know, Ross's stuff, but we've always asked this question of most of our guests, you know, you've been fishing a long time. You're, you're a captain, you're an accomplished angler. You've caught more big walleyes in a season than most of us in this building can even fathom in a lifetime. But how did it start for you? Like, I know Ross Robertson as an adult, promotional kind of. game. Well, kind of. Way, way to catch me on that. Yeah, you maybe are not quite yet. But how did you get involved in fishing? What did you do as a kid? What made it tick? Where did you grow up? What are some things? Did you just fall in love with walleyes because they taste good? Or <laughs> how does this work? Good, good question. Because, you know, I, I think backing up a little bit, I'm not. Not to be cliche, but in all realness, you know, if you introduce somebody to fishing, I don't know in 20-some years of doing this is my full-time job, Monday through Sunday type of deal. I don't know too many people that don't like it. And now when you throw catching in there, there's, there's two different things. When you throw catching in there, I don't, I can honestly say I don't know if I've had everybody that's like, I don't want to do this again. Now, again, you got younger people or people that are newer to it, maybe that's not their bread and butter. You don't catch any fish, but, you know, enjoying that day in the lake and things. Uh, the guy that taught me the game, the legend of all legends, I always like to give credit where it is due, Jim Foffrich, one of the greatest Great Lakes fishermen that ever will be. Yep. The number of things he started, pulling a planer board, casting hearts. I mean, seriously, this guy is like so many things that everybody does today. This guy was the first guy to do it. Yeah. And um, The Dave Gens of that. 100%. 100%. You know, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, just a true ambassador. If social media would have been around, you just wonder how things would have been different, positive or negative because of that. But... Nevertheless, he always said, I hope I you know, live long enough to see you enjoy a day in the lake. And unfortunately, he didn't. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I was still earning my stripes because I think up until about 30, they called me the kid because I looked like Opie, <laughs> right? And so you're still, you're earning your keep. You know, you got a like, solid beard right now, though. Yeah, oh, yeah, I have to. I look Bad. still like 29. <laughs> Maybe not. But Derm's got the baby face in the group. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, but... But, you know, I mean, getting back on, on the top of your question, but, you know, if you get people into fishing, and it's, I know this is kind of cliche and people think of me as goofing around, joking around, that's definitely the deal. But in all seriousness, fishing is serious to me. It's how I make my living. That's what I love to do. That's a passion. Mm-hmm. I definitely could have taken things with my education. You know, I got a finance degree. I've had turned down jobs that are just mind-blowing opportunities because I knew I couldn't do it, you know. Um, I turned down a crazy job out of college, just perfect, perfect, incredible situation. And still, you know, people are like, what do you think about that? And I won't get into that here, but it's, <laughs> and I go, not at all, yeah. you know, not at all. It's not even a, a question. Things worked out amazing. My mom cried for like two years, you know, yeah. thinking about like, <laughs> cause she just did, how, how are you going to do this? Cause again, nowadays with college fishing programs and all these things, I think that the opportunity level, especially with, I would, again, not going off on a tangent, but I think people nowadays, we can all say, forget fishing, that the work ethic or <laughs> Follow yeah. through is not what it used to be. So if a guy, just like with the ice team, I think there's more opportunities for people to work with our team than there ever was. And people would say, oh, no, it's saturated. If somebody comes in front of Matt Johnson and they're serious about fishing, they need to be the best guy and they're going to do that work, I think they have an opportunity, don't yeah. they? Yeah, we definitely listen. Yeah. yeah. And, and you have the opportunity and just look at the names. You know, I won't name names, but the guys that have built themselves through the ice team with, within the industry and then branching out from there. But anyway, hey, getting back to that, so – you know, I got introduced to fishing and just kind of little things. And I think that's the thing that people don't realize. And some of the programs that you guys do, whether it's recycled fish or, you know, some of those other things, it is huge, that thing of taking somebody fishing. I'm not talking about, like, for 20 years or every other weekend. You just take somebody and you just plant that bug. You know, I mean, I'm a competitive guy. I was, I was pretty good at athletics. I played them all through school. 
and quite literally, like my junior in high school, my coach is like, you know, I don't think you're going to play at Ohio State. You know, wrestling's real big in Ohio, and I wrestled. And you know, you're not going to get a you know, scholarship to Ohio State wrestling, but, you know, you need to make a decision right now. Are you fishing? Are you playing football? Are you wrestling, man? So we got two a days like this. You know, there's, I got a tournament on Saturday. He's like, <laughs> we don't have a tournament on Saturday. I said, no, I got a fishing tournament. <laughs> you know, and, and it's funny because I occasionally see those coaches, and I go, it turned out pretty good, didn't it? You know, hey, did you guys see me on my TV show last week? You know, and it, fishing is just my passion. And the competitive, and I still think sports and all that stuff's important for kids and that. But for me, I knew there was that point. It's like, hey, fishing's what I'm going to do, and that's what I'm going to dedicate all my time to. And, and then I think that the big thing that people, they expect maybe for there to be a door and you walk through it, and this is what I'm going to do to be a pro fisherman or a captain or an ice team guy or whatever. And, that's never, ever, ever going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, it was just little things and putting yourself in the right position. I don't think this is a fishing talk. I think this is a life talk for young guys, you know, and sure. I, I have these talks, and I know Durham's kind of like that type of guy too, where you just say, hey, put yourself around the right people, work your ass off, and good things are going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I never got into fishing for money. I never got into fishing for notoriety. And a little bit of both has come through that, and I feel so fortunate. And it was, again, it was just for me. Whether it's luck or whatever you want to call it, I mean, I grew up on Lake Erie, right? When you grow up in Toledo, you don't fish for bass. Yep. Nowadays, you know, one of my guys that works for me just broke the record, you know, all-time yeah. small yeah. record. So, yeah, maybe you could argue that a little bit. But we're in walleye world. I mean, we legitimately have more walleyes in my back door, literally from the site of my house, than every other walleye fishery put together. 120 yep. million estimated fish. So, it's like, you, you don't fish for crappies. So, that's why you catch so many. Right. There's, yeah. You're I not honestly, that good at fishing. Drew, I'm in the best spot. Drew, I don't want to be the, the downer guy, but even Matt Johnson can catch him where I'm at. Yes. Oh. Yes. So I want to back up yeah. for a second when you were talking about the hard work and, and the passion for it. What's interesting is you have a degree. Okay. Now, when you go to school and, and get a four year degree, two year degree, whatever, it automatically entitles you to a certain wage to a certain way of life. You go and apply for a job and they go, oh, because you have this degree, we're gonna offer you this salary. In fishing, it's not like that at all. In fishing, there's a ladder. Salaries are dream killers. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and it's not just with fishing though, it's, it's so many different avenues that people have passions that maybe aren't that traditional route that you present a degree and they say, okay, we're gonna pay you because you have done this education. You have to put in your time. And like you said, the little things that you do, there are so many tiny things that people don't realize that have an impact, whether it's working with a sponsor, whether it's working with clients, whether it's working with other guides that have such an impact that make you climb those rungs on the ladder and entitle you to a better way of life and more income. And take somebody that that wants to be a painter, okay? You can't just get a degree and go, oh, because I got this degree, I'm going to make great works of art and people are going to pay me for them. You have to put in the time. And, and one thing that uh, actually, you know, the Glorvigans? Oh, yeah. They, they had told me one time, and it was kind of funny because those guys are super businessmen. People oh, don't yeah. probably realize what they're doing behind the scenes and because they're not a look at me guys. You know, they're just making their lots of stuff. You guys can look into that. But he, he, Scott and Marty told me one thing a long time ago when I was getting going. I'm like, hey, I've only got like, you know, 800 people on my whatever it was. There was a Facebook or something. It was a, as all this was starting, this is 10, 12, 13 years ago, whatever. And I remember it was either Scott or Marty. I still can't tell the damn difference between the two of them. He said to me, he's like, you know how important seminars are You know, when we first started doing this, right? He goes, think about if you had 800 people in that seminar. And, you know, people don't think about it like that. You know, if you have that many people and just me walking around here, like I'm not a famous fishing guy, but a lot of people know me and how many people I'm humble and how many people walking around here like, oh, and... The, and when they start quoting things that you said on TV or TV yes. show 10 years ago, yeah. like, holy moly. Like, now all of a sudden you realize there's a responsibility here, too. Like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be too serious, but you know, on the big picture, you're like, oh, my God, people are listening to what we're doing, not just, hey, use this lure and that thing. So it's, it's a big responsibility all around. And uh, circling back a little bit, like, another thing I would tell you, like, this is the, probably the biggest argument within my family and more so, like, you know, my parents and my dad until he passed away was he worked hard he owned his business really successful guy i mean just totally self-made guy and he told me you're going to college or you're going in a pine box <laughs> and my dad got into world war ii yeah. my legitimate biological dad at 16. he was on a warship wow. world war yeah. ii 
So he's Dance. older for my age. Like when he told you he's gonna put you in a pine box, this guy messing around. He literally said, "Cause and it, it was out of a different type of love, you know, where he said, I want you to have the opportunity so you don't have to beat yourself up like I did. He did everything the hard way, you mm-hmm. know? And I understood that and that's like the different type of love than what we're supposed to have nowadays and the way things are. But realistically, me, for me personally, I still believe one of the worst things I did was go to college. Yeah. Yep. Because I think it held back what I knew I was going to do. Now, I'm not saying that's the case for Bob or Tom or Jerry over here or whoever it is, yep. right? Because for me, that was four years, especially if I would have taken that money and put that towards into building my business. Because early on, the, the, having the principle to do things is, as far as finances is right. probably the most difficult. Because I always say, you're not going to take what I've even done, which I, I, I can't even believe what I've been able to accomplish from a business standpoint. Forget the fishing with this. But if I was to still today almost, maybe not quite today, but not that long ago really, and you take that business plan of what was going on and you erase fishing from everything and you take it to a banker, they're going to be like, uh, sir, you're going to have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, that's, and the guys that get into it because they think that there's fame or something in it like that or money, they usually don't last. you right. got to have that crazy passion. Yes. Like, I remember even Al, like I like these, I like the old guys. I've learned so much and I like to give credit to him. Like Al, I've asked him through the years and had dinner with him so many times and said, you know, things, and it's the little things. And I hope I can have an impact at some point on somebody like that when you don't even know it. That's how, that's how the, the valuable stuff is, right? Yeah. Where he was like, um, you know, basically it's when you say something to somebody and you don't think about it, but it changes their, their whole path. Like, that's the stuff you got to do. And, and that's, those, there are people like that. And I see, like you said, guys on the ice team, same thing. Or they, they do these little things, the like Dave Gens, or maybe it's not even, maybe it's a guy that people don't even know on the ice team. Those little right. things that can change because I don't think people understand what's important until it's too late. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of a, there's a theme to some of these, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Didn't we discuss this a little bit yesterday yeah. with Scott? Yeah. yeah. You know, how we take for granted some of the things we might say and not realize the impact it has. Uh, this has been, I don't want to say eye-opening because I think we understand this, but once again, talking to Ross, you know, he sees it through that scope of fishing. And, and, I, and I think what that, in my mind, what that contributes to is the people we're interviewing, now, not to toot their horn, they're successful, right, in this industry. You're successful in the industry. Scott, Gens, oh, wow. right? We, they're successful in this industry. And I think if you pull out that little gem, it's that you're doing the extra stuff knowing or not knowing that it can make a huge impact on people, right? Like you said, Al, he doesn't realize some of the things he said that's impact you. Durham's doing it every day as a kindergarten teacher. You know, like you're, you're creating future good people in certain categories of life, right? It's happening. You Absolutely. Know? Now you may have some kids that you're like, my Lord, like this is challenging right did you have any of the johnson kids in no. school i've no. had because he's got I've, a lot of them <laughs> well johnson is a very common name in northern minnesota so the yes nevis i tigers. have i had the yeah. nevis oh, tigers geez. Yeah. home with the nevis yeah. tigers nevis uh, tigers nevis tigers <laughs> <laughs> uh but none of matt's kids but there are some times where you have a kid that has a background that you go i don't know how they're gonna make it I, I truly don't know how they are. And then you see them emerge because I've taught long enough that I've seen kids graduate yeah. and go on and do amazing things. And I've seen some of those kids that you, you at first think, I don't know how they're going to do this. And then they come out and they're victorious on the back end and you just go, wow, yeah. that's, that's incredible. To see them overcome those obstacles. And in our district, we have a high poverty rate. Um, a lot of people talk about um, like differences or inequalities with with race okay in our school our biggest inequality is income you have kids that are ultra ultra poor and then families that are doing very very well that live on the lakes and have these beautiful lake homes and stuff and so that's the biggest discrepancy and what we've learned about poverty is if you can break one link in the chain you have an impact on future generations forever so when you're talking about your dad saying you need to go to college or you're, or you're going in a pine box, right? That was what is, was implied for me too and for a lot of people. And you look at this whole uh, like student loan deal and where oh, people gosh. have, and, and we're not, politics. no, we're not, we're not getting into the politics part of it, but where a lot of these people have big student loans and, and people want to blame them and say, oh, they should have known, they should have known. When you were 18, you didn't look at 
what was going to happen with your student loan when you're 45, mm-hmm. right? And I don't have any student loans, so I'm just about done. Whatever. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it was implied by your parents that this is what you do. If you yeah. want a better life, this is what you do. And you figured out, well, I still did that part, but I found the passion. I got to follow my yeah. passion and found, find that dream life where I love what I do every single day. And I would urge any listener, if you don't like your job, if you don't look forward to going to it every day, you have one life to live. And if yeah. you don't enjoy every single day, you need to change it. Yeah. And that's on you. And that's yeah. why I brought that Agreed. up. Because like me and Durham are close enough in age that we had that. That's how it was. And I, I thought you were way younger than Durham. Well, I mean, I mean, look like it. Oh, yeah. I'm 46, but I don't look a day over 45. I mean, is this turning into like a Match.com episode? <laughs> oh, are we, are we at one of these speed dating things, you and I? Jeremy got the wrong equipment, no problem. Did they? <laughs> I didn't realize this was a setup. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, yeah. But no, and that's yeah, why. And long that's, walks on the beach. <laughs> yeah, for, for a crazy guy, I'm, I'm oh, God, these guys figured out the buttons now. <laughs> You're toast. No, I'm, I'm pretty calculated. All the craziness is not as crazy as you think. That's why I brought up, you know, the college thing, because I think nowadays, like, again, as a guide, I get a lot of people in my boat, and there's something it's like, it's like the couch for a psychiatrist or something. People tell yes. you things that they never do. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable! Sometimes you become the therapist too much, and the stories I yes. probably are barely appropriate for my podcast, not the Ice Team podcast, <laughs> and some of these. But I, I think nowadays I get these young kids, and I'm not. I don't look at it as I'm as I'm influential as Jason is, but I kind of am with a lot of these guys because these younger kids, where they're 12 or maybe even their 20s, their dad's there, and they literally hire me to say, "Hey, we're here fishing, but we're not here fishing." I want you to tell my kid or, you know, I mean, he needs, he just thinks because you're on the ice team or you're on this or whatever that he's like, he doesn't see the 20 some years and you know, breaking, physically breaking up your body. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so they don't see all that stuff. And again, I have clients all the time that come in both. They say, you, you give me, and I actually have done this quite a bit where I have clients. So I've hooked their kids up with other clients because they say, you bring me a kid that's like smart. I don't need him to know anything. I need him to be kind of smart, a little bit of common sense and even to work hard and as plumbers, electricians, I mean, these guys are making big money, big yeah. money, big money. And, and again, and some of these guys are working like four tens, let's say, right. And they can still do their fishing, you know? So maybe, maybe, maybe what, what I'm doing, maybe that's the second phase of their life or maybe, but you still got to have something in order to, you just can't just jump. Right. I mean, you got to do yep. something. That's why, you know, maybe you go work for a guy like me as a guide or something. And you're kind of working into that three days a week. We get you good enough that you can kind of do your own thing. And, Everybody just wants to turn the key and be the magician the next day. And that's why, and that's why when we say, like, there's a magical door, goose egg, or whatever you want to call it, like, that doesn't exist because you can't just be awesome at it. Even guiding, I, I think that there's a huge, Jason, I'd love to know your interpretation in the Northwoods. You know, down my way, it's just different, right? Like, we don't have resorts. The guiding is different. I spend quite a bit of time down in Louisiana fishing. whole different world down there. You can't make a good guide in a short amount of time. No. And a lot of the guides that I know, these guys are about done physically, mentally, mm-hmm. everything else. And I don't see it down below. And, I, you know, it's not like, well, if we don't have good fishing guides, the world's going to end. we got way bigger problems turning on the news than that. But I see it. I'm like, man, you can't. It's kind of like electricians and plumbers. We have a huge shortage. A lot of these guys are getting retired. And it's like, well, you need an electrician and a plumber a lot more than you need a fishing guide. But it's the same problem where to be good, it takes, it's kind of like a professional athlete. I have a lot of professional athlete clients. And you have a window. And I, I, I'm probably at the end of my really, really good, to be perfectly honest. I'll, I'm, I'm better. Maybe your same thing with you, and you don't do it probably as many days in a row as I do. But for efficiency and knowledge, but also the physicality, because it's brutal on you. So I'm, I'm towards the end of the physicality realistically. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're hit middle of your 40s, Durham. So it is a little bit different in the Northwoods because I'm not encountering that big water every day. To give you, To give you an idea... Okay, last year, and, and I, I guide every day, every single day um, from the end of May until, well, gosh, uh, beginning of November. It's every day. And I put on about 135 hours on my engine. How many hours do you put on a year? You don't want to know. I do. No. I do. A lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Because, because you're making these big runs on huge bodies of water. There's times where... I don't even start my engine. I put my trolling motor down and we're fishing an area by the axis because that's where the fish are. But talking about that whole, like finding the right personality 
in a guide, it is like an athlete. You have to have a certain talent. You have to have a certain outgoing personality to be able to step into that role and think in a certain way. But have you had people that have worked for you, guides that have worked for you in the past that have gone out then on their own and become independent and essentially become your competition? No. And the reason is, is I was, I, I've seen that. See, the, the thing is, I started with, I like to think the smartest thing that I did is I paid attention as a young kid. I, so I traveled with Gary Roach, if some guys haven't watched some of my stuff. And I sat there and I watched what happened. Jim Fofrich and Dave Hansen from Bemidji, Minnesota. Yep. was the best fisherman, even Gary Roach, the best fisherman he's ever met. I learned so much about fishing, but more importantly, learned a lot about life from these guys because I sat back. And the most important thing is, believe it or not, Matt, because I see the look on your face, and I kept my mouth shut. Yeah. And that was the best thing I ever did. And I just watched because you get a whole lot more by listening than you do by talking, right? I've changed that a little bit because I do a lot of talking now. But I, for a long You're time, just, yeah, I watched what was going on. And when you see what, how things and how people, I don't care what people say, I care what they do, you know? And so I saw all of these guys, you know, like tournament fishermen. How many tournament fishermen don't talk to their partner? They don't talk to their teammate, their travel partner. This guy is running off with this guy's wife. I mean, the stories are, again, more appropriate for my podcast, but maybe not even that. But, it, you know, and I'm like, okay, this is not an Ohio thing. This is not a Minnesota thing. This isn't a walleye thing or a bass thing. This is, this is just what kind of happens 90% of the time. So the guys that work for me are guys that, generally speaking, because most guys I would say you go with, you got a really young guy, you got a really old guy. That's how it is. You got somebody trying to get into it. And, again, if they're good, they're going to move on. They're going to take from you. They're, they're not going to be there that long. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's, it doesn't fit my plan, but, you know, that, that works for a lot of the resorts and things like that. And then you've got the older guys, which is generally what I have part of them. I've got the guys that already did their thing. They want a little comfortable umbrella. They want me to deal with all the headaches. They want to deal, They just kind of want to show up. They, they, they've done their tour of duty. i got a guy right now that works for me. He's 60-some years old. He will beat the absolute tar of everybody at this table. Just an iron man. And he, fit, he doesn't need to be there physically, financially, nothing. He, but he is just, he's wired that way. Mm -hmm. He's in my shop. He works more doing the, all the other stuff without saying anything than any of the young guys. And he's still wanting to learn, you know, his boat rigging and some of the other stuff that I've gotten pretty good at and just the mechanical things. And so I, I've kind of gone that direction. And then the other bulk of those guys are super successful business guys. So it's different for them because they've got kids. And, and these are actually, they're not my best guides probably, but they're my best fishermen. And so I have to place those with the right people. So these are guys that own a business. It's not about money. It wouldn't matter if they got paid 10000 or 10 bucks that day. They want somebody there at the ramp that day to go fishing. Because the one thing that I learned, and I've kinda, I don't even like to probably tell people this, but is there's a lot of guys that, let's say they got $10 million in the bank, but on Tuesday nobody's going to the boat launch with them because they got this work. They got grandma. They got the doctors. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And so I provide them with somebody that's going to be there on Tuesday that absolutely wants to be no other place than right there with them. Yeah. And then instead of spending 150 bucks in fuel, because even it doesn't matter how much money you got, guys don't like forking out crazy money all the time. So these guys justify a really nice boat and just like, buy whatever they want for tackle because it's part of the deal. It, it, it becomes a business. So that's kind of a side thing. And then I don't have any problems with guys running off or the lying, the cheating, and the stealing. But unfortunately, is the dirty part of the guide game. And, and it's just, it's a reality. And so I've kind of done the untraditional thing. But truthfully, my guide business doesn't really rely on other guides. And it's, that's painful a little bit, you know, from the fiscal standpoint, because there are guys, you know, even guys on the ice team here, they got 15, 20 guys working for them. That's not my deal. Generally speaking, the guys want to fish with me because I started doing educational stuff because Al, he told me a long time ago, Bubba, you need to do the educational deal teach these people and so that's my guy like they call me up they want to go with me which is awesome it's a blessing but at the same point you can't really duplicate that so a lot of what my other guides are is if you want to come fishing with me and you've got a group of guys they've been doing it maybe you do a bucket list trip every year and you got eight nine guys i can't put eight or nine guys in my boat and so we accommodate that group or more traditionally and why i even do what i do when i started when i worked for jim Fofridge. There were six pack trips. You guys have probably heard yeah. about that. Kind of like Lake of the Woods. You know, you yep. got this 27 sports, you got 30 foot sport craft. You got six guys on and a captain. That's what their license is for. All my guys have a master's license, but nevertheless, we put one to three people in a boat. And so we got these six pack groups, and the guy goes, Hey, you know what? Bob retired. We need, we got six guys we go every year. So we accommodate them with multiple boats, you know, yep. whether it's two or three. And so it's just, a, it's a business, maybe not even a good business decision, but it's, it's the right one for me. I'm the exact. Exactly the same. So we have, 
about seven guides in our area. The majority of us are teachers. The other one's my stepson. For years, I was the only guide, and I needed help because my business grew to a point where we couldn't accommodate everybody that was coming to the area. We rely on tourism. It's a huge thing. We have tons of lakes, lots of water, but they're all small. So like the resort thing, you're talking about resorts. Um, we don't do as many trips at, at resorts as we used to probably. A lot of VRBOs are otherwise just people coming to the area, people that own lake cabins. Boy, working with realtors is a big thing. Somebody wants to buy a, a lake place. Oh, sure. And they go, well, we want to know what kind of fish are in there and, and what the fishing's like. They hire me and I take them out there and I t- we tour the lake and we fish. And, and they go, yeah, I'm going to buy the house. Realtors really like that. Well, I had my best friend I, since childhood. I said, and, and he's very passionate about fishing, fellow teacher. And I said, I can't accommodate all the people. You might want to consider doing this. And he said, well, I can do two or three days a week. And all of a sudden he's doing six. <laughs> And then we had another guy, and, and now we've got some younger guys that have joined in too, um, who aren't from the area, which is unique. One, one from up on Lake of the Woods, and one from down in southwestern Minnesota. And, and you look at it like, okay, I could hire you, but I don't want that. I, want them, I don't want to take money from them because they went out and worked hard. It's a better business plan if I do that, but I don't want employees. And these guys are so great that I could with all confidence say to any client that I've had, if I've had them for 30 years, I could say, go out with this person and you're going to learn stuff. You're going to have a great time. They're going to treat you well. And we all have the same personality. So there is no competition. That's a unicorn situation. It so, is. You know, it's a hundred percent. I think I could do, I was just thinking about this and I don't know, it's like the elephant in the room. I think my next podcast is going to be guide horror stories oh. because I've either witnessed them, been a part of them, seen them from a distance, mutual friends, or it's insane. It's, it's the biggest hen house on the planet. You, yep. you cannot have me on that podcast. People ask me in the boat and on the ice, almost every single trip, have you ever had a jerk along? And I can tell you honestly, in 30 years, not once. Mine mine come from, when I have those situations, usually it's the corporate trips. Yep. It's not yeah. a, a pro- what I would call a private trip where somebody reaches they're out to me. They're not even fishermen. Yeah, they're, their company they is paying them to go fishing all day. Maybe a business that 8, 60, 80, 100 people will hire 30 guides. That's where we have, I guess you could say, issues. You know, but I do think it's funny you mentioned the realtor thing because, like, I spent a lot of my time guiding on Lake Minnetonka. Right. There's an exuberant amount of houses. And every year I do multiple trips where somebody's like, hey, I'd like to book you. I'm like, what do you want to fish for? Well, I don't even care if we catch anything or even go fishing. And then I know exactly where that conversation is going. It's someone that's looking at a, a spot on said bay on Lake Minnetonka. They want to know if this is the lake for them. And oftentimes we spend that entire day driving around on a boat. Right. And even stopping at different bars and seeing things in it i'm teaching them about history and culture and like this island's been here for this long and here's a place you can go to eat and here's this and here's that and there's where the eagle nest yeah there's outdoor conferences or uh, concerts right here where you can bring your boat oh really yeah people do church on the water over here and you're teaching them all that kind of stuff at times And, and i definitely don't guide on on erie or or tourists where i don't have tourists I have businessmen, right? Yes. I don't get tourists that come to the Twin Cities to go fishing. Uh, but like like both of you, it is all educational-based. Mm-hmm. People book us, and I think it's, it's a testament to, and this is going to be one of my next questions for you. It's a testament to how we hold ourselves in this industry as educators, right? They, fishing, you know, you mentioned fishing catching. Yeah, you're never going to find a person that doesn't love it. 100% true. But I think most people remember these guide trips or at least from my perspective, guide trips with people that teach them something. Mm-hmm. I went home and I can do that again on my own. It's one thing to show up to a spot and say, drop down, you're going to catch a fish, boom. But if you can leave that client going home going, no, I think I can do that. I learned something. It's, it's, it, to me, that's a big deal. But I think one thing that people might lose track of, and, and you were kind of getting there, Ross, alluding to it, is that, it's not just about the fishing, right? To be a successful guide, I mean, look at what you're doing right this second. Rule, rule number right? one for young guides. Yep. Not even the, direct, the direction you're going, but not. Rule number one for young guides. Find out every given day what the importance is. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, we're not talking business. We're talking just somebody in the boat with you. If you're a young guy, don't think. And, and here, a good example, several of the guys that work for me, absolutely butt-kicking fishermen. Um, truly one of the best ice fishermen I've ever met on the planet. Like, I promise you, it's Shorty Craig. Mm-hmm. Sure, nobody knows who Shorty Craig is, but you do not want to bet a $10 your house or anything. I don't care even if it's old Mr. Gens himself. I mean, he's <laughs> that guy. But every day I tell these guys, you can't, you don't, what you need to understand is they probably, even if it's a four pounder, that may be that guy's biggest walleye. Exactly. Yep. Don't downplay it. Yep. Take the time to take a picture. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, a hundred things. But the thing is, that I can't tell you this because every day it's different. For every person, they're important. Sometimes they're just learning how to not tangle their lines. Yeah. <laughs> Um, like you said, some people like the scenery. They're not as into it as we are. But you have to find that. And, uh, and here's, here's the second tip of within the first one. They're not going to tell you that. No. Especially guys. Women, a little different story. Guys are not going to tell you what they mean. What they say, erase it. It doesn't matter. That's not what they mean. They're either too embarrassed or they don't even know. But you gotta, you got to be an investigator and find out what is important to this man right now. And guess what? On Monday, unfortunately, on Tuesday, it's a different answer. You know, maybe even with that guy. But, and that's the important for guiding from inside the boat. I always sure. say that success is relative. Mm-hmm. Because there's people that may not have caught a species before. They, they, maybe they've, the biggest fish they've ever caught is a rock bass off the end of the dock. And you might not know that. So when somebody catches a 20-inch northern pike in my boat, before I throw it back, I say, do you want a picture of this? Yep. And to you and I, we would go, oh, that's, we're not doing that. That doesn't even make sense. For some people, that's a huge deal. Yeah. A huge deal. And sometimes, and you've probably had this too, where you have people that go out on a trip like with somebody who's terminally ill. I've done make-a-wish trips, man. Absolutely. That's, that is bittersweet. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Absolutely. It's hard. But to get those photo opportunities too, and I've had trips like that where I, where I take a picture and I go, this is a, this is a picture that's going to be at their funeral, yep. and it hits you deep. Right, and it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, when we do these corporate deals, whenever we sit down as a group, 30, 40 guides, whatever the number is, and all these people are coming in, and you can see the excitement. That's always one of the strongest messages we try to portray: is don't bash the hammer handle. Right. Don't bash right. if, if somebody catches a 18 inch pike. There's a good chance with this crowd that could be the biggest fish they've ever caught. Yep. You know, and I've heard the situations, and I've even had it happen to me, not thinking clearly where, you know, here's a little pike, flip it to the boat, try to shake it off. You take it off, you throw it in the water, and then the person that caught it is kind of silent for a bit, only to find out they go, that was the biggest fish I've ever caught. Or that was my first northern ever. Yeah, that was the biggest fish I've ever caught. And you just threw it away. And uh, so, yeah, it's all perspective. And the relativity of you guys talking about really diving into these people. I mean, but that, I'm telling you guys, like, not to toot your horns, that's what separates. Like, all the email conversations we have with our guide clients for a week ahead of time. Like, give me the 10 things you want to know when we go fishing next Tuesday. Send me an email with 10 questions you want answered. And then I can look at those 10 questions and go, this is exactly how I'm going to structure this day. You know, so I come into it going, okay, this person really wants to know how to drop shot. You know, and you know what? I bet you they don't even know how to tie the hook, right? So then you start to get the wheels turning and go, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talon down against this bank and we're going to break down why you drop shot. We're not even going to fish yet. And then you see that person grab their phone and they're videoing you doing what, then you go, then then it clicks perspective that day it clicks and you go okay this is what this person wants today i'm, I'm going to give you, know? you a simple tip for guides and then this may be not apply to minnesota waters or whatever i do not carry a scale on my boat no i own 100 of them yep i put one in for the fall brawl for obvious reasons with clients and stuff but as a young guide or as if you're on trophy waters do not carry a scale mm-hmm. and people are going to argue this and 99 percent of people are say you're insane but let me tell you why you don't want to do that I can tell you a million times we get a fish in the boat, and it's the biggest fish. I had a guy from Chicago this year. He said, I've been fishing walleyes for 62 years. He said, the first 10 minutes with you, I broke my personal best three times. Like, what, you know, I mean, that makes it still get a little warm fuzzy, even yeah. the crotchety old son of a gun like me. But if we would have put those fish on a scale, what's everybody in Lake Erie? What's the magic mark? 10 pounds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Most 10-pounders, when you put them in your hands, I'm going to tell you right now, they're seven and a half. Yep. I can eyeball a fish, and I bet guys all the time, especially my sports guys, my athletes. Guy makes a couple million bucks or more a year. Well, I'm going to take a couple extra dollars out of his pocket. It makes me feel good. Yeah. So I say, <laughs> what do you think this thing, what's it, what do you think the length is? What do you think the weight is? And I say, 100 bucks a guess. Let's do her. 
So just so you know, I'm undefeated. I, I, I can, that's what I do, right? Yeah, I, it's just like anybody else. The guys can measure. Carpenters can look at something and say, hey, you need two inches off that two-by-four or whatever. Yep. You know what you know. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, is when you have a scale in your boat, I saw so many deflated people. Exactly. Because they focused on the wrong shit. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So we have a fish that this guy's his biggest fish ever. He's been fishing 60 years. He says, is it a 10-pounder? I didn't answer him. You know what I said? I mean, I'm, I'm blowing my cover here with some of my guys if you're listening to this. But I say, you know what? It, it, you know, it's a nice one and it's close. Because what happens is when you say no, they just took the best moment of their bloody fishing career. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you, <sighs> right. and they focus on the wrong stuff. Yep. That's absolutely Inst- right. Instead, I, I turn them and I take a million pictures, you know, and then we don't know. And then I tell them later. But I t- usually take measurements and I'll take some pictures and I'll say, hey, I can send that to you later if it's important to you. Yep. If you want to do a reproduction, I can get you in touch with somebody. We got all the stuff. Yep. yep. It doesn't matter. How many times are you in the cabin and you see a fish up there and then somebody's like, what is, how, how many exact ounces was that? Right. That guy's usually the guy you don't want in your cabin. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, and so you, you focus on the wrong things. And that's tough, again, with some of my guys beating them into them because these are all tournament guys. These are uber competitive guys. The same things that make a good guide make a bad guide. Yeah. you got to skirt that line. I've oh. had a client mount a 24-inch northern pike. Yeah. 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 And, and us at this table would go, we, you know, let's be honest, we're not even going to photo that fish, right? In, as individuals, right? For us, if you caught, if you got a 24 inch pike, you, you, you're not taking a picture with it. You know, client shirt. Sure. But I had a client one time catch a 24 inch pike. It's on his wall. It was the biggest fish they've ever caught. You know, and going back to that topic, looking from the outside, looking in, that is, and still to this day, Jim's biggest fish he's ever caught. And he's so happy. And I've seen the mount, you know, a little comical, right? And I think he's, he's educated himself now, this was 10 years ago, to know, okay, I was a little naive, right? But at that moment, and he was a 50-some-year-old man at that time. He's in his 60s now. That when he caught that fish, he's like, I'm getting the, this mounted. I love and that. Yeah, it was, it was cool. I love that fishing is subjective. Yeah. That... You can take a picture of a fish, and I, I take measurements of fish in the boat all the time, and people go, what do you think that weighs? I don't know, because I don't weigh the fish every yeah. day. And I'll go, but I'll tell you this, it's a it's really, a really nice. nice fish. Yeah, and exactly. that's what matters. Yep. You take a picture of a fish, and somebody sees the picture, and they go, what did, what did that one weigh? What did that one measure? I don't know. Does it look yeah, nice? It's a nice Because it was yeah. a really nice fish. Yeah. Well, that, that, you keep that excitement. And you get ex- and I think you hit it on the head. Both of you said it. You know, when they catch that fish, you want the excitement. You want it to exude everywhere. Absolutely. You know, high fives, this and that. Get oh them pumped up. You know, this is, and I always We're joke, still here to have fun, guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's what that, that's always been my motto of working for Clam is everyone's like, oh, what do you do? So you sell fish houses, this and that. I'm like, oh, no, I sell fun. Mm-hmm. Like, I sell fun for a living. That's what, like, we get to do. Uh, it's, it's awesome. You know, I do think, you know, we should touch on some ice fishing side I was of, just of what go you down do that route. because, you know, you can I mean, some years you don't get to ice fish, but when you do, I'm the most envious human on the planet because the way you ice fish and what you do and some of the transportation measures at times to get from A to B and everything, it's it's something to be told. Yeah. Right? And I have so many questions yeah. about this. I this is what yeah. I've been looking yeah. forward to. Let's jump into some ice ice fishing with Ross. I, I gotta say one thing before I do that, guys. If you're not a fishing guy and you just listen to the half hour. If you ever played sports, it's kind of the same thing, in my opinion. Because I'm not a fishing guide, but I've like poured my heart and soul out into sports like my whole life. And everything you said from surrounding your, yourself with the right people, yeah. grinding from a freshman to a senior, it's it really is the same, in my opinion. Like you can't just expect to jump on the top of the mountain. You got to work your way and surround yeah. yourself with the right people. Go Absolutely. through all the all the heartaches and everything to get to where you're at. Right. So. Good point. If you're listening and you're not a fishing guide, right. just like myself, you could be. I mean, you could I'm, totally be a guy. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I for sure. I mean, not yeah. a good one, but but you could be there. <laughs> I mean, I do guide my friends a lot. I guide Sarah, which is, I mean, if Get, I can guide Getch. Sarah and my buddy Getch, like, I feel like I could guide him. <laughs> So Next it's one. it's funny because obviously we like talking about fish and stuff, but people are always like, oh my god, the grizzly bear Ross, he's talking about all this like down deep stuff, and you know mm-hmm. there's a different side too. But yeah. you know the thing I think with, when we talk about fishing, as I get all the time, and not really from the guys that know me on the ice team and stuff, but outsiders or maybe you call them haters or 
keyboard commanders. They're like, how are you even on the ice team? Or how do you do this? Or how do you promote and design this? Are you, are you even ice fish, bro? You live in Ohio. And I always tell them, like, I don't ice fish 150 days a year like some of you guys do. We don't have it, right? Right. But I would argue that I'm as passionate about it as anything. And, and passion's one thing. Yep. But how many of you guys spend the amount of time that I do to get your gear with, I mean, I, I already have my stuff on an island. Mm -hmm. The amount of time and money that I put into ice fishing and doing this stuff is absolutely ass backwards. From a business standpoint, even my accountant looks at it and we see things and he's like, you know, he don't know what ice fishing is, but he knows these balance lines and he's like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm a total package. I, and I love it. <laughs> I, One in a million. Like, I, I want, I love ice fishing, right? It's certainly not for, you know, if you're on Lake of the Woods, I think most of those guys up there, they make a majority of their money ice fishing. Yeah. I am completely in the red doing my deal because of the amount of time. Like, I literally just took all my ice stuff to an island. We were talking, we are working some prototype stuff you guys are going to like with Clam. I got to get this through island because we got a plane about the size of this table, and that's not going to fit in. Or, you know, we got to work on these things and get the promotion and do, and do all these other things, figure out the stuff so that we work the wrinkles out of these things. And, you know, two years ago, I went by myself to Cascade and drove 32 hours because I knew we probably weren't going to have a great ice season. We ended up did, but... All of those things that, you know, we're doing to fish on a... How many guys that say, oh, I'm an ice fisherman? Well, if you live in Minnesota, no offense. Yeah. But if you lived in Ohio, would you go rent a house on an island and spend all the money that it takes me, even if we don't get it, to do that? To fish I, on a two-mile by two-mile section? I'd call Ross Robertson. He's got a house on an island. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Networking. It, it makes a lot <laughs> more sense. So, I mean, I, I am passionate about all forms of fishing. And truthfully, ice fishing is my favorite thing to do. Yeah. of all of fishing pursuits anyhow i mean because when you catch a big walleye like i already know i'm setting myself up when i say this you know trolling is what we have to do to be successful day in and day out our fish move three four five miles a day like yes you can mega live them or you know and do all these things but it's very very difficult to be consistent currently with the way people are doing things yeah there's here and there but day in and day out i can't do a show or a promotion or get you know, Betty and Sue Smith from Minneapolis on fish, you know, for the one day they're coming with me and going to Cedar Point the next. But catching a big walleye on a short rod, you know what I mean? And big watching walleyes. Oh, when they fill a 10-inch hole, yeah. if that doesn't get you excited, as I always say, take up bowling. Cause we'll we'll throw some pictures friends. of Ross up on, on some of the comments. Yeah. I mean, you're talking 13-pound fish, 14-pound fish. We're talking big, big walleyes. I've had days where I've caught more than 10 fish scaled, because one of my buddies likes to call me on these things, uh, over 10 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get some, we'll get some images up on, on the comments so you can see some of the stuff Ross is catching. I love it. Yeah. If it doesn't fire you up, I mean, just it's, it's adult video gaming, right? So it's kind of like everybody's all, like the younger generations get into fishing more now, which is, you know, it's, it's a good thing, right? But they're doing it because it's like adult video gaming, like the mega living using the live sonar. And now with ice fishing, I mean, that's almost, it's almost mandatory. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I use the example affectionately and, and with respect to you, even in my seminar here yesterday at the show, and I said, listen, I can beat Dave Gens if he's just staring at a hole. Yeah. If I have even traditional 2D sonar, I mean, it's that important. And now when you throw that, like, mega live like I'm using by Hummingbird in there, it's insane because I can see. I was, I was telling them this it's kind of off topic, but in my seminar the other day, I said, how many times do you miss a fish or not get a fish because you're not doing something right, whether it's sure. the presentation or it's the, um, you know, the, the way that you're working it, the, the size of the bait, the color, all these things, right? Like how many opportunities do you get before you figure it out? Some days you don't figure it out. Where on like Mega Live, I can see 25 feet to the side, so I'm seeing the window where those fish say, no, 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 Charlie, before they even get to me. Yeah. And I, so I'm, I'm switching off of a Tika minnow to, you know, a leech spoon or something like that immediately. I, I don't let four or five opportunities fly by, you know, and, and that opportunity, it, I, I realize it's not in everybody's budget and different things, but if you don't have that, you, you're not going to catch as many fish as if you have it. It's falling into people's budgets. I can promise you looking at show, sports shows and hearing some of the stories, uh, it's aggressive. Uh, no, but you're, you're spot on. But so I, you, I think sometimes you send us pictures to poke fun. I, I, sometimes like e sometimes I get a the random double walleye hey, hole. Yeah, like hey, it's you know I'm I'm on them. Or sometimes I don't think you even say anything. I get a smiley face icon, and there's like two thirty two inch walleyes, and then it's like consecutive drops. And it's I like, say, is this good? Yeah, is this good? Did I yeah, did I do right good? Thing? Did I do the right thing? Yeah, and I, I I love what you said about how passionate about about ice fishing, and and you are right. I, mean, I remember years that you you call me and you're like, hey man. 
I'm trying. I'm trying to help Ice Team. I'm trying to help Clam. I'm trying to help Ice Armor. I'm trying to do. I, I I'm looking I'm at. I'm in a boat three, in January. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm. I was trolling planer boards this morning to catch walleyes. I just don't know. And you've even done like your passion's so strong that you've even like driven Cascade uh, off the table. That's crazy. That's insane. But you've even called me at times and said, you know, I drove, you know, three hours north to get on some bluegills just so I can feel like I'm doing something in the ice world because it's kind of depressing right now. I don't yeah, have this. 100%. I don't have that. Um, it's personal, but it's also the business side of things. Yeah. Because, you know, I feel like I have responsibilities to you guys, and you're yeah. understanding, and you guys have been great. Yeah. But, yeah, there's sometimes where I'm like, I'm not really into bluegill fishing. But, yeah. you know, testing stuff out because I think sometimes I just give a different view on yeah. some of the stuff. Mm-hmm. I know you got a million guys that do certain things, and but, it's again, you get a little different take on something. I think you even asked me one time, like, when the bluegills, you're like, how do you guys do this all the time? <laughs> 100%. I don't remember, but 100%. And Drew, Drew, Drew makes the comment before, too. He's like, he's like, catching this or catching this right i and said it, like you're you were like all fired up about crappies one day which i like catching crappies but you're like we're gonna catch a 17 inch crappie and i'm like that's pretty sweet it's like really big crappie but it's still like that big I'm like i want to go catch a, like a mediocre sturgeon on the rain he's like 50 yeah I'm like that thing's like pulling yeah. your boat around you yeah. know hadia says the same thing hadia will say like well yeah i do the crappie and the blue thing yeah when i get bored of catching real fish you know like i just go get my fix and he's like i'm good I think I need to move to Great Lakes. Yeah. Let me tell you a short story. He actually just walked by Brian Lindbergh, one of our, our guys. I yeah. took him ice fishing, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, way before he was with Clam. And he, talked, he still talks about that. Yeah. It, what I look at, and I'm, I'm going to tell you two brief things about this. I look at it as ice fishing is like hunting. Okay. If you guys hunt at all or you do any of this stuff, I mean, I'm not, I don't unfortunately have the time to do it, even though I like it. Um, it's like a hunting trip from the standpoint, the adventure just getting there you know when you when you take off in the pitch black and you look out into literally like an ocean technically Erie's an inland sea by definition yeah and you're like oh my gosh you know and it's it's like a hunting trip where do I where do I what do I do I start to break this down and just people taking the pictures of the ice heaves that are 30 feet high and all those things it's like man this is my lifestyle like this is me mm-hmm. you know and I think that that is as, as important. I like catching. Do not get me wrong. I always tell people in seminars, I like fishing. I love catching. Like I, I still have to have that aspect. That's the competitive nature of me. But so many of my clients fall into that play. Really good story. I have a client who has fished every month with me except for the winter. And him and his wife, they don't care if they catch 100 walleyes, if they're 10-pounders or 2-pounders. They enjoy life. The life has been extremely good to them. That's being underly generous, I guess you could say. <laughs> and so he's, and he's just just a great human being and he came to me and he's like i fish with my wife that's what we do so you know if we can't go with today because the weather's gonna be a little shaky i understand you got to get paid like he's that type of guy he's like but i don't want to beat up my wife and i don't want to burn her out on this and so he came to me and he's like man do you guys ever get like a winter when it's maybe mild because i really want to fish every single month with you this guy lives down south i'll just keep it that anonymous and he always says yeah well 70 degrees is kind of cold you know that's cold to me right I said, you know, you ought to think about ice fishing with me. It's a very limited deal. I can't even promise. you got to be on short notice. But this guy, he's kind of semi-retired. And he's like, okay. So he looks at me and he says, Rawls, I've lived 72 years without walking on water, and we ain't going to start this year. <laughs> I said, I understand. I said, but I said, you asked me. I said, I'm just telling you. I said, I think you'd enjoy it. It's a different deal. And he loves hunting. He goes all over doing that stuff. He calls me up out of the blue a couple weeks later, and he goes, I was thinking about that, Ross. He says, I trust you. He's like, you're like my adopted son. He <laughs> says, we're going to do this thing. I said, okay. And he said, you get a hold of my, my lady. And he says, he still calls her his lady. I love it. This guy's just so amazing. If, he was, if you had him as a client, you'd just be like, this guy's the greatest thing ever. And he says, yeah. He says, um, you get a hold of my lady and tell him what we need. I said, all you need is boots. You got everything else. You need different boots. Other than that, you're good to go. So he got him some ice armor boots, and we wanted ice fishing. And it was literally, you could not have picked a worse day. It was that polar vortex. Of course. Mm -hmm. It was, I don't remember the, I'd I'd be lying if I told you the exact deals, but I'm in the game. We had 40 mile an hour winds and we had, it was like 20 below real temperature. We do not get that in Ohio. We just do not. That's not in our realm. I don't think our thermometers go there. The marks aren't there, the whole deal. And I look at him and he goes, we're going just to say we did. Hmm. And we're on the island. And I'm like, are you sure? 
no, no pay, no problem. No, what you know, this is this is going to be questionable for where we're at. I got to pay. I, I regardless of what your decision is, I have to pay attention from the safety standpoint. If these winds switch this direction, right. this becomes a whole different conversation. This isn't comfort level at this right. point. We left my Argo running the entire day. I mean, it was that cold, you know, for us at least. Right. right. Took a bunch of steps, and we went out there. And this guy, he just and he got on. He was catching them too, which always helps. And when we got done with this trip, he came up to me and he's getting on the plane and. He pulled me aside. It was like a movie. He pulled me aside. He's like, we got to talk about this real fast. <laughs> and I was like, uh-oh. And I was fully expecting him to say, like, I'm glad we did it, but we ain't doing this again, right? And he took me aside, and he says, I've been good to you, boy. I said, you've been very good to me through the years. I appreciate you. And he said, how good? Good enough that I know this is a limited deal. I know you ain't got many spots, and I know you got a lot of people with all that stuff you do want to go on on this and he says have i done good enough or what do we got to do to make sure i'm on this list each and every year and he is a prime example this guy yeah. lives 70 degrees is cold to him and he didn't even know anything about ice fishing and just again it's a different kind of variation of what we were talking about but once you do it man i i don't know anybody doesn't like it yeah success helps yep success yep. breeds success so if, so if you have a client you know Hearing what you're, what we know, and I know enough to be dangerous about where you fish, how it works, the seasonalities, the, the lack of thereof. Let's say I am somebody listening or watching this. Like, it's pretty easy to call Jason or myself and book a trip. Like, we know what to expect every season. What we're gonna, for the most. Well, how do you handle it? Let's say, let's say right here at the St. Paul Ice Show, right when we're done, somebody walks up and they're like, "Hey, Ross, love you, love what you do. I want to go ice fishing with you." How do you continue that conversation, knowing that? I don't know when, I don't know how sometimes, I don't know where we're going to go, I don't know. How do you, 20, 30, 25 years of doing this, how do you navigate ice fishing guide trips? There's no good answer. Yeah. I mean, you have to have somebody that's, it, it, it's not applicable to many people. Sure. For many reasons, but logistics obviously are, are part yeah. of that. If somebody has, you know, like, you, like one of my clients is a UPS driver, and he has to ask off for work almost 12 months in advance. If not, it's shifting schedules, you know, and, and then you don't even know what that stuff. Like, he's not a candidate for that. Yeah. You know, that's just, I can't do anything about it, right? I mean, even we don't know if we're getting ice on February 10th or if the winds are 100 miles an hour or whatever. Sure. So there's not a good answer. It is, and that, and that's... That's a, it's a horrible part of it, but it's also an amazing part because those people that show up knowing those circumstances and knowing what those logistical challenges are, they really want to be there. What, yeah. uh, what's the earliest that you've ever had ice to get out there and fish? Man, you know me well enough to know I'm horrible with dates and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't, you can't tell time. So. Yeah, I don't. I have a thing in my pocket that occasionally does it for me. But um, <laughs> before... Uh, before... <laughs> Is that the sarcasm button? <laughs> Before or after Valentine's Day? Yeah. I, I would say back in college, because I can remember as a really young kid, I was telling one of the, the guys there, I think it was Kavias or somebody, that I can remember as a kid these guys having these giant tractors, like old school giant tractors, like, you know, like, I don't know, those old Ford ones, those giant ones, and with these homemade sleighs, and they would take you out, and there was like a giant Christmas tree they would mount out there, and like on the hour they would be back and forth. And they drop you off or whatever. I mean, this is like when I was really, really, really young. I can just barely remember this stuff. And that's that was kind of the end of, uh, like, I can remember seeing pictures of cars and stuff out there. Like, we're talking on the mainland, you know. Yeah. Now. And for whatever reason, you know, we, just, we don't have those hard winners where I'm at, generally speaking, anymore. And so it, it's just a whole different cup of tea. And we, we can't balance anything on it. No, like, in... I would say end of high school, early college age for me. So whatever, 25, 26, 27 years ago, something like that. I can remember having some harder winners, but then not. You know, but having one of those, you're like, oh, this is good. And we could kind of do a lot more. And that would generally be around like Super Bowl time. You know, so January, you know, January. Crazy. Yeah, January something. Because again, you have to remember, it's it's not just having ice. Like you guys go out and put sheets of plywood out and you're on four inches or something. We Our actually don't, don't put what? sheets, sheets of, of plywood out. <laughs> yeah, this is a thing. I, I think ah. it's more urban legend than I've, anything. I've, but I've done it. I, I was well, going to say, I've I seen have, it. Like, like big boards and stuff. It is not easy to slide a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood around out there. No. But you so walk in water, term. I... Well, I used to weigh a lot less. Ross wants the button. <laughs> he tried to push. He pushed the. 
one? Oh, not that one? <laughs> I'm just going to hit them all. I can't. I've been looking at that board and I just want to go, like, hit one of his students on yeah. this thing. There's a reason the board's closer to us and not closer to you. It looks like one of those games I used to have as a kid. Anyway, yeah, four inches. Yeah, though. you're definitely older than us. That's an Atari. Yeah. yeah. I did have Nevis. an Atari. That's a I, big Drew game. is Nevis. just like, are you, were you my teacher? <laughs> I resemble that comment. Uh, I. Pong. So, so yes. So four four inches mm. up here, we can go out on. Yeah, I'm what taking, do you, what taking you, that out on four inches. Yeah, what we are you looking dog. for? I mean, w- when when you measure the ice and go, okay, we can actually get out That's here. It's not going to be a hundred percent safe. No ice is a hundred percent safe, but yours is a different situation altogether. We. I don't have numbers per se because numbers are deceptive. Same thing people say. How many? What's what's how many foot of waves are we not going to go in? Whole another story tangent right. we don't need to get into. But three foot is, you know, that three foot isn't three foot isn't three foot, right? It's not a measurable thing. Same thing with ice with me because on the islands where we're at, it blows in. It's a current break, okay. And there's certain places in the island you don't go. And I can tell you certain little areas that this is where so and so so and so and so and so lost their life. And you just know you don't go there. And so eight inches, if I have to be held to a you know, gunpoint here on the islands. Uh, but even then, what people have to realize, eight inches is not eight inches. Okay, yep. we get, obviously, as you guys know, we get shitty ice, we get good ice, we get this, we get honeycomb. But it's current eats it. Yeah. So I can go out on eight inches and it's still 20 degrees. And last night it was 10 degrees and we didn't lose ice. And I go out and I'm on four. Because current current eats it yeah so we don't play in that world not, not like not like, not like not like not like that not yeah. like that we we yeah. deal with current uh, yeah. lake minnetonka i mean yeah. you, you horseshoe, have chain, horseshoe chain i'm dealing with it all the time yeah. with you Bay, think of, that you, had a lot of current. oh yeah yeah but our, our current's different right you know, well, we, we deal with current from springs we deal with current through bottlenecks but we don't deal with big water yeah current. so a, a little backing up head of fisheries for ohio works for me great friend of mine he says, this is not me, this is these guys, at the, the fisheries. Lake Erie is two things. It's not actually a lake. By definition, it's an inland sea and a river because we have a constant west-to-east flow. There's this little thing down at the end of us called Niagara, and it, it pulls some stuff out. I've heard of that. Um, yeah. Every two years, this is a fun fact, every two years, every single drop in Lake Erie is gone. It's replaced. Think about Unreal. That. Lake Superior, over 100 years, hundreds of years, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just a whole different deal. And, and we have that different suction. Like, th- there's other tributaries and things, and they're not Detroit River or Maumee, that Sandusky, yeah. da, 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 I don't know. So, yeah, that current is coming. It's whipping through there. And that's why the Bass Islands are basically, give or take, 12, 14 miles of a big break. So that current goes up to the green circle. It basically slams that ice. So it's like, eh, maybe this isn't even great, but at least it's like a backstop. Yep. And then we get out of those areas, so we're basically fishing, in theory for you Minnesota guys, a wing dam. <laughs> it just happens to be, you know, you can't see Islands. across it. Yeah. yeah. So it's a different deal. When you're on the mainland, that's even, you know, that's more dangerous. I have to have more ice myself because the other thing would be now we don't have a lane. So when I go out there, guys are like, oh, we're just going fishing. No, we spend several days setting a path, checking walking out the entire distance area we're going to fish and literally spud bar the entire playing field if you will you know unfortunately it's it's still two miles by two miles on average but you know you try spudding two miles by two miles i mean it sucks like the, yeah. back to the passion part of it like but that's what you have to do yeah. you know so when we're on the main one it's actually more dangerous because you can't check all of that it's impossible and we have tons of heaves tons you know and we don't have that backstop and we have the current run through there we have deep to shallow so then that creates different things, right? So for me, I need quite a bit more ice to do that. And then the other thing is, is again, you guys have seen the news, right? Mm-hmm. I've been interviewed many different things here, you know, on a little bit of a cheating scandal. We won't get into that. <laughs> but, you know, even before that, I can remember being on Good Morning America because there was 5,000 people stuck on Lake Erie. And they yeah. said to me, why weren't you stuck there? And I was like, and I literally a little less tacked back then, I guess, or maybe a little sarcasm button. And I said, um, I have common sense. I didn't go out when we had a south wind at 40 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, because these sheets separate. When you have ice heaves and you have a 40 mile an hour wind and the whole lake isn't froze, that's a problem. Yeah. So the few years that we've had the whole lake freeze, it's, it's so key because now the puzzle pieces don't have a place to go. Yeah. The, our problem is, is we've got this thing called Pennsylvania and New York and it doesn't freeze and it's like 50 miles across. And so when we get a big wind, you go for a ride. 
you know? And so that's why we're kind of playing. We don't necessarily fish where we want to fish. We don't necessarily fish where all the fish are at. We fish where I can go home and, you know, where we can just be yeah. smart about it. And it's I, funny because, like, you you made a comment, like, when we get good four inches of ice and our lake's locked up, we know in our minds, hey, we can go out there and fish on it. We can walk. Like, yeah, we take our precautions. We check spots. There's certain spots we know, whether from experience or whatever, that it's a little rough. But, like, sounds like if I'm Ross and there's four inches ice, it's not even an option yet. No, God, You no. don't even consider it. Where, no. you know, putting that into perspective, you know, and that's where I, I do want you to touch on the airboat. Because I know one way you get out to ice fishing spots is via air, airboat. Am I right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I was telling some of the guys there just earlier, and they were kind of mind blowing. Just so you know, airboats are not a, a dual. They sink a lot of airboats every year. Sure, a lot, and it's generally because typical thing: an airboat doesn't really have flotation. Essentially, it's a really expensive John boat with a big fan on the back. Yeah, you can angle north and you go south, like. But it's a boat, and so a boat's better than an anchor, right? But at the same point, it's the weight thing. And the guys sure. put too much stuff in. They put too many people. They put a four-wheeler in. They sink a lot of them, especially I call them ice pirates. I'm sure yeah. I'm going to take some heat over that. But these guys, <laughs> that, you know, you got your four-wheeler stuck on a flow, and the guy's like, hey, Jason, I'm going to get you your four-wheeler back, but I'm going to need three grand. And you're like, well, it's not worth three grand. Well, the EPA's standing there. And they're, right. they're you know, so it's like we got to get the thing back, um, you know, fiscally, responsibly, and everything mm-hmm. else. And so, you know, yeah, some of these guys are call it good business, call it ice pirates, whatever it is. But you know that's where a lot of the ice boats and, and things are. I personally use Argos. Um, you know they float. Yep. You know I do have a, a big utility sled and things that we use. Like I took the Cascade and stuff. But you're using different forms. Uh, like when I took Brian and those guys when he worked for other people, we took them out there. That I wanted to give them a different experience. You know those, they're not the end all be all. They they really beat you up too. And yeah. there's a lot of maintenance that you need on them. Um, is but that, it's, is it's, that what you took Kurt out in? Yes. Okay. Yeah, one, one time. I t- we took him, we, we gave him the full experience. I don't know why, but we did. Yeah. We put him in, a, in an Argo one day. Um, I know we put him in, the, uh, in an airboat another day for sure, too, just to kind of show him the different ways of doing it. He things. said he got too scared and he's never going with you again. Yeah, and, and I actually talked with Brian yesterday about that, and yeah. he was like, he is such a candy ass. He is, he is <laughs> for sure. I mean, because it was like legit. It was, it was, Can't you didn't, block. you truthfully didn't even need the airboat, really. Um, but again, we were shooting, you know, some we we're shooting some promotion stuff. It's kind of part of what we do, and you want to make sure that the guys are safe. We had more equipment when you have camera stuff, and when you're with a guy that doesn't ice fish, um, you know, that's the thing too. It's like when you go, and again, I'm I'm, I'm not trying to sell people guide trips because I probably don't have room for you anyhow. But when I fish with the guys that I do, like Shorty and these different guys, it's not because they're incredible fishermen. I mean, it is, but I probably need him to help me. Potentially, because I've pulled five people out, and I don't want to get morbid on this deal. Yeah. But some of them ain't here, you know, and it, that's a scary deal because they're, they're not prepared. They don't understand the consequences, and they don't understand, you know, they don't have the equipment when it happens to make a bad situation good or favorable. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's maybe a different deal than, you know, it, it's, it's the same with your early and late ice, though, right? I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's... Well, yeah, we're, we're always on safe ice and when we you know obviously that's our that's our focus and you know i don't take any risks i know jason doesn't but when it comes to the fishing though in in erie let's say you get to where you want to go things are lining up you know favorable you're like you know we're gonna get on out we're gonna get to these spots we want to get to i feel good about i got the, the the chisel out i got the lanes of travel what can like our listeners expect like what is your result like is it typically he's you're, asking me the guide question well no you know you you, no. you have 120 million fish or yeah. you know like what is like do you anticipate like okay this ice fishing thing's going to happen which sounds like there's a lot of things to make that happen do you then do you do you instantly smile knowing like we're going to be catching some fish like what is that level of expectation I get the question, Bob yeah. Parker, but here's the deal. So <laughs> I, I know exactly where you're going with this. We don't have 120 million fish under ice that I'm going to take you on is the problem. Right. Now, this year, could we? You know, the forecast is looking very favorable, but I've been through a few of these prom dates before. Yeah. You know, we'd be stood up, right? Yeah. So so who knows? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, I hope prom dates. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Ohio prom dates? <laughs> well, I, and I'm going to get on you Minnesota boys in a minute. I'm, I, Nevis I, prom dates? I went to prom Nevis six, prom dates? six I don't have times. a button for Nevis prom Ooh. dates. You went to? You had six guys take I, you to the... No, I went to prom six times. 
Jeez, well, that's for a different podcast. <laughs> Good grief. I think you need to get on Ross's podcast. And yeah. Explain more. Yeah, well, we're gonna have to have you on there, Derm. Matt was that. really good on there because he talked and everything. Yeah. Was, that was good. Yeah, but we went off. We went off on a lot, a lot of tangents when we oh, were. We just started talking about my six prom dates as we're talking about your expectations. So <laughs> I think we should continue down your path. <laughs> yes, <laughs> bar's been set low. Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't. Again, it's what we talked about earlier when we were talking deep and not fun fishing stuff. You know, I may get somebody their first ice walleye. So sure. it may be a three pounder, and I'm like, eh, okay, but we're taking time to take that picture because that's that first. That's a yeah. first. That's his first, and they ain't gonna happen again, right? Mm-hmm. So there are years where, again, this is serious Ross, not Grizzly Bear Ross, that some of you guys know, where I'm just happy to be able to be on ice and actually catch fish because I like sure. I told I told the guy walking through the show, and he's like, well, yeah, how, how much do you even ice fish? I said, well, last year I ice fished, and I don't think I publicly have said this, 42 days because I normally don't keep track. But last year, I was like, man, I couldn't believe we got the season we did. We were extremely limited, right? But I told him, I said, I don't think there was anybody that ice fished in Ohio for walleyes 42 days besides me last year. So now, if I said I fished 42 days in Minnesota, I get laughed out of the, you know, the room. Yes. But I caught more walleyes than anyone in Ohio last year, yeah. I, I think, or close anyhow, right? Because of just what we were doing and all the steps that we had to go through to do that. And so all of a sudden, that bar is different. And it's the same thing when we're in the boat. There are days, it, it, turn, well, let's go back to my tournament days. That's how I started. That's how I kind of got my rep, right? That's a lot of guys that let's do. There are days where you catch a 40-pound stringer on Lake Erie, and you're the man. And there are days you catch a 40-pound stringer, you don't get a check. Yep. So the bar is always different in fishing. And, that, and that's what I hate, but it's also what I love. Because there are days where you come in and just catching a limit. You know, those walleyes are such pesky son of a guns. Just catching a limit is a big deal. And another day, if you don't catch 50, like, your buddy smoked you, right? And so, for me, I don't really have an average day. Like, I don't even, sure. I don't even like putting that down. Um, everybody getting in and out, getting, having a good time. Because, again, one day just catching a limit. And two years ago, my best day on the ice was barely catching a limit. And they had a little derby amongst all the guys there, you know, and nobody caught a limit. And I was like, man, this was a tough day. And I went in there, and I was kind of like, oh, I caught a limit. You know what I mean? And then the next day, I had 50 fish before lunch. Yeah. Are you uh, now? Is there current under the ice? Where are you fishing straight down, or is that is your lure being pulled on a regular? Are you asking me if I'm still trolling? The answer is no. Yeah, I mean, because I know like some, you know, we go, we went to Swam again with Tommy Hicks, and we're we're degrees. putting our Vexlar 10 feet in front of us so we can see our lure. Well, I mean, and, and you know, we've had meetings. I, I obviously can't make too much of this public, but you know, with Clam Pro Tackle, and I'm like, guys, yeah. I need this. But I got it bigger because I can only use it twenty five percent of the time physically, yeah. and and that's what me and uh, Brian were talking about yesterday. And he's explaining to some of the other ice team guys. He's like, until you're there, you don't understand because, again, when you're on let's say a river in Minnesota or something that does freeze over enough, and that the guys will, will sneak out on, you generally are going to have your lure going down and going west. That's what it's going to do. With us, and that's why in the seminar I was talking about my triangle drill. So you have to follow some of my own stuff to figure that out, but. We may have it going, let's say, west, and a three-quarter ounce lure barely can hit bottom. I can't see it on my flasher with the transducer below me. An hour later, it's going east. Then it's going south, and that's switching. And then it'll go, you'll have no current, and then you're fishing a flutter spoon, right? Mm-hmm. And, and when we have current, it's very difficult to fish. It limits what you can physically put down there. It, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. But at the same point, when we don't have current, the fishing is usually much more difficult. We so experience that on Schwalbe. Yeah. Do you yeah. ever fish for anything other than walleyes through the ice? I love big perch. That's I was going to say, there's some big perch, big smallmouth. Do you ever catch muskies? I have caught one muskie. Yeah. Um, you know, we've done a little bit of the catfish stuff, but you know, I know Matt's big into that. But truthfully, when my thing is, is I like walleye. So I generally, instead of going doing A, B, or C, I'm going to go to, to Saginaw Bay, or I'm going to go okay. to Lake Ontario and, and chase walleyes, try to figure them out a different way, see if it's the same. And truthfully, again, I can't complain. So people that are listening to this probably will not understand it like the guys at this table. I'm always in business mode. Yep. I'm fortunate yeah. enough to make my living completely from fishing. It's serious business, like my buddy Fred says, because how I feed my family. But at that point, I have to understand, hey, I get to do this. This is great. But I always have to be gathering. And it, it, at times, it, I'm always like, wah, wah, wah. but I'm gathering photos <laughs> or I'm working yeah. on, you're, you're testing yeah. things. Like, you don't know tough. Oh, it's great fishing. Oh. As guides is sitting at this table, you guys understand this. But when you're fishing lures, 
that probably aren't going to catch them, but it's part of your job to test that out and find out why, what, where, or when it works, when it doesn't. That's not as fun as you guys no. are just going out on Saturday. Right. Using rods and figuring out, you know, reels that are, are breaking, you know, testing things. I mean, that's part of my job. Yep. And it's Thank not you. fun. It's not. That's <laughs> not fun. I mean, it's it's not. Like, I, I know guys are like, oh, man, it's a great part is doing R&D. No, it's not. I like getting the final runs of things. And I may or may not have some of the guys that work for me get the first runs and give them a little and don't tell them. And then they're like, oh, this thing's junk. Oh, this is amazing. I need another one of these. You know, yeah. or same thing with lures. I always give everybody one. And they're like, I got one. When they come back and ask for three or four more, then I know it's a winner. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like our Katana big game series, Russ. Yeah. You know, you were instrumental in testing those, designing those for years before we came out with them. I physically built the prototypes I know and you mailed did. them to you. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, listening to some of that, like, you know, I'm glad you bring that back full circle because we use Jason the same. Like, Jason gets to see and test things way before, you know, sometimes we you know, have fun with it. Maybe it's an article of clothing or something else. But, like, you know, there is way more. I mean, we kind of started with this to some degree. There's way more to this game. Like you said, hey, Matt, you may have some come up to you that in this room that likes to be a part of Ice Team and this, that, whatever. But it's not just about fishing. You, you guys make a living in this fishing business with a lot of it not having to do with the art, the actual act of fishing. And I think that's something that has resonated through a lot of your conversation today, you know, that it's not just about going out there and catching a fish. It would be a lot harder if it was just about that. I'm going to tell you straight up, again, I don't want to sound like the old man because I'm still going to whoop some people's butts fishing, okay? But as I get older, because again, while I'm not a super old guy, I got like 25 years making a living strictly doing this. I hear guys all the time like, I'm a pro fisherman and no disrespect you work at ford motor company or whatever you do monday through friday no disrespect to you but when you do it seven days a week and that's all you do and that's the only way you make your money it's a different deal yeah and grandard kind of alluded to that grandard's like you know he's getting up all due respect to grandard he's not a spring chicken right and he told this to us on the podcast so i'm not knocking the guy where you know he's gotta he's starting to like shift a little bit of his focus from just like the guiding the fishing the 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 grind to like you're seeing them at more shows and events and seminars and promotional stuff and doing things like that and getting a little more business savvy. And, and I think that's just good advice in general. I've always yeah. been, I think through my whole career, I've done both of those things. Sure. And that's why I'm kind of, you, know, you get a little worn out. For me, it's shifting. And I guess it's a little different perspective in that I'm enjoying the day in the lake. I'm enjoying the camaraderie when we go on a shoot with Clam, that it's not about, okay, I'm super competitive. Don't get me wrong. I want to be known that I, I belong at the table or in the room and I, you know, that type of deal. But at the same point, that doesn't consume me like it did because I feel like I've earned my seat. Sure. And I like talking about Jason and talk, Hey, how are the kids, what's going on? Or, Hey, you know, what, what kind of dumbass costume are you going to do next year? And he'll go, I'm not going to tell you. And I go, okay, Mr. Wonderbread ice suit, you know, ice armor suit, <laughs> yeah. Wonderbread. You think oh, yeah. it'll sell? Probably. Probably three suits at least. Right. Yeah. Would, it glow? Would, it, would it glow to Nevis? Just a Nevis. But again, we should I, make a Nevis Tiger suit. <laughs> oh, but in all seriousness, I think With that... Will Ferrell and kicking and screaming. W- <laughs> when guys like some of the guys you mentioned, you know, are, are going that direction, some people on the outside may be like, oh, he's losing it or whatever. But we're more relatable yeah. to the people that are walking through these aisles because that's what they're doing. And they're enjoying their time at the cabin mm-hmm. with the guy and that. And, and, it, and it's just an evolution. Like my buddy Shorty, he says, I ain't that mad at the fish anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm still a little bit mad at him. Yeah. Pat yeah. Smith uses that comment all the time. I hear it all the time. I'm, I'm not I, not mad at him anymore. I loved when I was so ch- uh, talking with Chuck Hassey and interviewing him about Leech Lake and some of those legendary guides over there and just how much respect he has for them. And we are talking about, you know, those guides, some people might think because of their age that they're losing their edge, that maybe they're not on the cusp of the changes in technology or, or whatever it is. And in reality... They have far, far more knowledge than you'd ever imagine. And just like you said, shutting your mouth and listening. I, I saw that even you know fishing with him just a few years ago with Gary Roach. Yes. And I, I use this analogy, and I, I may have stolen it from somebody I don't know, but I, I think it's my own. I said fishing is like bell bottoms. And people go, what do you mean? I said, 
you, I can remember it wasn't that long ago, them girls all of a sudden, you know, those hot girls you were talking about, Durham. <laughs> I don't think but I, I ever mentioned you, any hot girls. Drew? It, it, yes. Did he or did he yes. not? He, he specifically he said, said they were girls, pretty no, girls. I would, and they were pretty, too. No, and they, I, were, the word, they were attractive. Attractive, attractive girls, attractive. prom dates. I don't know, Drew. Whoever is editing this attractive. absolute dumpster fire, please give me that three-second <laughs> clip to let the kindergarten teacher know he's misrepresenting. But no. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> the kindergarten. Whoever's teacher. editing this dumpster fire is the. Guy. Drew's like <laughs> that. <laughs> that's me. Yep. Yeah. Oh my mm. God! I'm so off. Is it absolutely? <laughs> I mean, what? What are we talking? What, where are we at? Yeah, okay, yeah. I wanted to bring up something about Gary Roach because I've known Gary for a very long time too, and uh, one of the coolest things ever that a lot of listeners probably don't know is um, I was I was doing some seminars over in Fargo, North Dakota. And Gary and I were the only seminar speakers for the entire weekend. So he would give a seminar, there'd be an hour break, I'd give a seminar, and it'd go like this for three days. Holy smokes. Uh, Gary's Ooh. wife, Beverly, Beverly, sits in the front row of every one of his seminars. And I, and I saw her there, and she had a book with her. And I said, Gary, that is amazing that you've done this for so long and Beverly comes to every one of your seminars and he goes, yeah, she sits in the front row and reads a book. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jeez. I he's love heard, it. He's I heard love it all, it. probably. But, but the support that she shows for him is it's yeah. admirable yeah. when yeah. she reads a book. Bever- I, I won't say some of our private conversations, but I have had some interesting conversations with Miss Bev. I'm and he, sure. has her, he has her embroidered on his shirts. Yeah. You know, he's still got yeah. embroidered shirts. Yes. Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah. yeah. The old school fishing tournament look. The embroidery yeah. patches, all that kind of but, stuff. But what that bell bottom philosophy is, is w- even the young guys now. Like we've got a bunch of young guys on the ice team, and they don't they don't know about bell bottoms, and they don't realize that it's come back around. You know yeah. what I mean? So whether it's like bobber, if we got a new bobber yep. with clam, you know, like bobber fishing's been going on forever. But there's younger guys that haven't been around enough to know that like the Malax night scene because oh, yeah. that doesn't that you can't do that anymore, right? Right. So again. All these things that if people think it's the first time that this has come around, and it's like Grandpa's sitting back there going, "Yeah, Sonny, you got a little bit to learn." Yeah. And and with fishing with Gary, I've seen that where there's so many things that like are now people go, "Oh, this is a tactic," and I can remember in my relatively short time of doing this, you know, let's say it was almost 30 years ago with him, and him showing me these things that now people are are putting out there as breaking. Look at the rejuvenation of hair jigs. Love hair jigs. Holy yeah. buckets! Yeah. I mean, that's blown up over the last several years. Oh yeah, and, and they catch us. fish. Check up my chair. Yeah, oh. we've well, had that, that's part. Of, that's part of being at the show and doing yeah. this at the show that yes. we expect. Tony Mariotti came behind us Drew's just a minute groped. ago. I know, and took a, a Mister Heater away from us. Take my chair. I know because we, we've had, we got spilled, spilled on at the Blaine show. Yeah, we had somebody yeah. drop like an entire cappuccino on us. Tim Moore has towels over there. Yeah, he's not listening, but that's good. <laughs> Just, yep. just like one of my podcasts. Uh, this Nobody show listening. is it's 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 rocking right now. I mean, you can probably hear busy. a bunch of ambient noise behind us. I mean, we got. I'm looking at hundreds of people let, just in eyesight. Let me give our, you a little perspective. Is again like the bell bottom thing. I've heard some people here going, "Oh man, the show isn't busy right now or whatever." Well, you guys are so spoiled. Ice shows that are around my neck of the woods. If we had half the people in them that are in here on a slow time, people would be just jumping through. Yeah. Like, you Absolutely. Got perspective. Perspective, yeah. No, this, this is, is the deal. This is good. No, we could talk all day. I know I know Durham's got a seminar he's gotta go to soon. What is it um, on? Is it fishing even? Probably. I don't know. Uh, well, it depends on how far off course I well, get. It's kind of on topic to what we've discussed. It really is. Yeah. You a, know. Gu- a guide's trick for tricky fish. Let's talk about that with you for a second. Those days when those Lake Erie walleyes ice fishing just don't seem to want to go what do you do what are some of the things that that you switch up in your approach to try to get your client on fish and i know from a guide's perspective it is one thing to go out and catch fish personally it is a total different thing to get somebody else to catch a fish oh brother the stories i could tell you yeah i've got a guy and i'm like real 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 he's got an eight pounder in his line because i see it on mega live and he just is like jigging with an eight pounder on your like, yes. How do you not feel that? But he doesn't. Yeah. So we need to adapt. And it's but those days where it's slow, where pounder. those opportunities are not coming as quickly as they should. And, and a client messes that up. I don't want to say messes it up because it's all relative with experience, right? 
But when that opportunity is blown, it's it's really defeating as a guy because you're like, we should have had that. I I still get frustrated. I, I'm better at not outwardly showing it. I don't and, outwardly show it. And and the thing is, is I know some people they, they react differently to that. And I usually tell them, I said, listen, man, the time that I don't give a shit about this is the time I ain't in the boat no more yeah. or on the ice. You know what I mean? Like if if I don't care, and, and I, but I I try to handle it better or differently because it's big picture but to answer your question i think we got to go to al linder 94 you got to take care of the bite windows and so when you see at the end of the day if i see you at the pub and we're having a burger afterwards over there and you're like hey i got 21 and i'm like oh my god you know he caught one or two or because that, that's a reality we hear that it all is time. A reality. and people are thinking what immediately they go what lure are we using Right. What are, what are, and, and again, I say this in my seminars all the time, and, and there are certain personalities that are successful right now because all they tell about is what lure it is, and I understand we're on that marketing end of it. I try to teach the people the other things that are more important. Yep. It isn't as well received because people don't understand that because you're only hitting a small portion of these people because they want the simple, quick fix. Okay. But the bite windows, you have to kind of have, you can't be course correcting. So you got to be good enough that you kind of know where you got to be and you got to be kind of doing the right things during those bite windows and take advantage of them because you can't all of a sudden switch to a pinhead pro minnow now and guess what we're going to catch them just the rest of the day and that was the trick does that happen sure but realistically i'm catching six seven fish in 10 minutes when they're just doing it but i'm taking advantage of it i'm not doing the wrong thing i'm not moving around i'm not throwing you know things on the ice making lots of noise um it, it's the things that people don't think are important you know, for me, it's, it's maybe different than you guys. I said this in my seminar yesterday. I'm like, think about this, guys. When you come to Erie and you haven't had success, because there's a few people that that was the case in the seminar, and they said, hey, man, this is, this is different than Minnesota. I said, well, we don't have we don't have snow like you do. We don't have ice like you do. Guess what? We got super clean water. I can see the bottom in 25 feet at times. Those, all three of those things mean spook factor. We don't have that cover sure. from, from top quite literally to bottom. So now all of a sudden we need to do things different. We can't be dropping thermoses, you know. We're, we're taking those little snow patches and we're fishing on those. The little we're, we're using the shadows, you know, all these little little things. Fishing on just the edge of those heaves to kind of camouflage ourselves, you know. Little little things result on, you know, it's like baseball, right? It's yeah. getting an extra one two hits here and there, just constantly grinding. And all of a sudden, at the end of the day, you got 20 fish. I got a tip for you. Oh, you should bring out four by eight sheets of plywood. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was going to be adding to the dumpster fire. Durham, I want you just to go straight old school the rest of your fishing career. And do what? I don't know, just old, old plywood, do old school stuff up in Nevis. Like yeah. using the original fish yeah. trap? Yeah, original. Well, I mean, we, did, by we didn't change. have anything like that. Shoot, growing up, we just had like a four by eight fish house that was plywood and with a spear hole in it, uninsulated. And we had a wood stove. We would get scraps from the birdhouse factory in Nevis, Minnesota. <laughs> um, but cedar, cedar chunks of wood. So your 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 <laughs> Lake of Wood tourism is cringing right now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> your your fish house would smell like people's sock drawers used to smell when they put those cedar packets in there or whatever. But you talk about condensation. So old school, okay. I will make a wooden sled <laughs> with old wooden water skis to pull out a four by eight plywood fish house. I can do that for what, you. What too. did Brower yes. say he started on yesterday? It was a, a a wooden toboggan sled with coal. A coal a coal a sled. Coal sled These was, guys are not that old to be asking. You know, they're acting like they're Santa Claus. Yeah, I am Santa Claus. Yeah. You're Mr. Wonder Bread. <laughs> Mr. Wonder Bread. You are Michael Jackson meets Mr. Wonder Bread the last two years. Talking about age, yeah. I'm guessing. Tinder? No, I'm guessing you're a lot like me in that uh, internally you don't feel any older. You're wiser. Oh, I your physically feel it. Your, yeah. your internal dialogue is the same that it's always been. My sister has a two and a half year old and she says we understand each other. So yeah. <laughs> I can believe that. I've known Ross for what, 10, 15 years and I've been with Ice Team like 14, 15 yeah. years. Yeah. And you're uh yeah. You may be feeling older, but he does not act or think older. Right. Oh no. Right. You, you <laughs> that never what? changes. You have to And I know you I know Durham fun. doesn't no. either. Yeah. No, not one you, bit. You yeah. you've I'm People that don't really know me are always surprised when we have something kind of like this or when they fish with me. Because, again, like you said earlier with Sobe or something, like how they are, 
dude, I promise you I'm not a character. I'm a yeah. straight, you know, it comes off as a character at times, but that's just me. And if we're fishing yeah. together, that you're going to get the same thing. It's just I don't play anything. I don't say this is what I'm going to say today. Yeah. But I think that people don't realize how serious I am about fishing because it's I'm so focused and I love it. But at the same point, you got to have some fun, guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. people really forget to have fun. No fun. No fun. Oh, yeah. God. No fun. Mr. Thane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a dumpster fire too. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know what? I mean, we've been talking for uh, ninety minutes. Uh, probably should wrap it up a little bit and go back to real work, I guess. And uh, otherwise, this dumpster fire could get out of control. But Dr- Ross, you know that could be the title of this one: just dumpster, dump- fire. A dumpster fire. Ross's Ross Ross. dumpster fire. Ross, you've been a, such a wealth of information. I know from from our perspective as Clam and Ice team, man, we you, we lean on you for a lot of different stuff: the testing side of things, uh, the colorful commentary. Uh, I know when you do come out to events, it's always fun. You know, it's Jason's the same way. We got I, I love all of our pros equally, right? But there's certain characteristics of our pros where I know we're going to have just wholehearted fun. Uh, so I was excited to get this one put together. None of them are at this table, but, yeah. but it does happen. I was right? happy, Jason, because at first I'm like, oh, you know, Jason's time at this show uh, is so valuable in a retail booth. You are one of the best people we have, period, at selling interacting with people at a show at sun so i know taking you out of reeds or whatever booth you're in is 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 good and bad sure uh so from that it's awesome so but i'm happy that both of you got a chance to do this together because like i think there's some similar characteristics and personalities i totally agree and and uh, and it's it's an absolute honor to to sit down with you we we truly get to see each other at this show each year that's pretty much it maybe maybe one other event and we rarely get time to sit down and chat. Yeah, yeah. That's so, occasionally we see. I remember we saw each other at like a Detroit boat show or yeah. something here yep. and there. But yeah, it, and it's a shame. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not as into the shows as some of the other guys. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Keep my, keep her forward. But I do like seeing the guys, and it's unfortunate exactly. that it becomes a semi annual or annual event. It's to like do a that. family reunion. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Are you yeah. going to Bassmaster this year? I'm going to try, but it's really not looking good. I've been there the last two years. Yeah, yeah actually, right. we see, I saw Drew there. Yeah, you got we the we rode on the bus together. Yeah, yeah we did. And, and Gens made a comment last night at his after party, and I, and I loved it. We talked about it on the way here, me and Paul Gazzoni and my kid. You know, he made a comment when he walked into a surprise 70th party last night, and he said something like, with tears in his eyes, because that's Dave, and he said something like, you know, I people always ask, why do you come to these shows? Like, And he's like, you know, honestly, it's – this is where my friends are. He's like, my friends are here. And, and if you really, really take that into perspective, at the St. Paul Ice Fishing Winter Sports Bowl, Dave Gentz, right, who we all can, like, if there's one icon in this industry of ice fishing, that's it, right? And he walks into a room full of 130 people. And it's not about even the show or the products or the fish trap that he designed. He's here because he's like, my, friend, my friends are there. And pretty awesome. And the great thing is, his friends don't just consist of the people that are at Clam Absolutely. or at Vexlar. Yep. It's everybody yep. on the floor. Yep. Yep. Le- legend. I hear the term legend all the time, especially oh, yeah. by the young bucks. And yeah. I'm like, you don't know what legend is. Yeah. The guys we talked about, like Al, Gary, yep. Gens, those guys are legends. Yep. Legend. If, you, if you have to ask or wonder, you're not. Right. right. You, most of the people haven't even done it long enough. Right. To be in that yeah. category, in my yeah. opinion. And I've heard some people like Dave and the Pat Smiths, right, say, make one comment that's always sticks is, I've forgot more than you know. Legend. Yes. Right? And, and it's not a, a, a comment meant to be egotistical. Uh, it's the legend status of it. You know, we're been there, done that. And we owe a lot of our current tactics, our way of thinking, uh, our way of doing things uh, to some of these legends. And, and uh, I guess, I guess. Well, we can part with maybe some parting comments, and mine would be, you know, at these shows, since we're at a show, and, and Ross is here from Ohio, Durham's here from Nevis, right? Gens is here. We got people from all, Eric Hadia. You know, take the time to talk to these people, you know, to talk to some of these legends that could be here. Uh, that's why they're here. You heard it yourself from Dave Gens. Like that's, he's here because his friends are here. His family's here, his fishing family. Uh, so I would always encourage people to take those opportunities at these shows to talk to Ross, to get the questions about Lake Erie, uh, to talk to Durham, to, to goof off about the suit he was wearing. Like That's, to me, one of the strengths of these sports shows. And honestly, one of the strengths of the industry Amen. is, and you alluded to it, 
We're all in it together. It's all fun. It's not just the Clem and Vexler guys that are Dave's friends. It's everyone here. Uh, the fist bumps are rampant. The stories are rampant. And you're making memories and having fun. I mean, it's been fun, Jason, but I'm hoping on the next one you're not there so you don't steal my thunder. <laughs> wow. I thought you guys loved each other at the beginning of this. What, but button, what button do I put? All of them. Oh. All of them. There we go. All of them. Oh, yeah. All of them. <laughs> oh, there's a good one. <laughs> they, they, they put that board way too close to me. Oh. <laughs> Dude, no, this thing. is fun. That, I I like it. I, yeah. I honestly doing like my podcast, doing your guy. I really like. You're those. good at it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. It's just, it's it's nice to get a different perspective. As long as I've known Jason, you know, you learn things every time about somebody. It lets you feel a little closer. And again, like agreed. For me, it's fishing end of it is fishing, but the camaraderie end. The older I get, the more I appreciate it. The more I want it. Well, I love it. Sweet. Yeah. Well, anything else, boys? I know, Jerm, you're probably going to get back to work. I got to get back to work, so it's probably time to extinguish this dumpster fire. And so I would end it with what I always say. Be safe, be smart, be a hero. Take somebody fishing. Awesome. Thanks again, Ross. We appreciate you. We appreciate everything. Until next time, we'll catch up.